you are looking live, or you're listening live, to the Peacock Alley American Grill and Barn, the historic Patterson Building in downtown Bismarck, and another hour of the Legislature Today radio show is on the air on 550 K Fire, AM 1100, the flag in the Red River Valley, and AM Talk Radio 1090 in the Bakken. Thank you for listening. We're glad you're along. Uh, don't forget, the all-new Legislature Today radio show is on the air every evening, two hours, Monday through Thursday, and also uh, Saturdays, 10 a.m. until noon. Uh, our plan uh, this Saturday is to talk with a number of legislators who are back in their districts about their plans to interact with constituents in their communities. We might have to add a weather report uh, or two uh, for this Saturday. Yeah, maybe submission. the weather will keep them all here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. We might, we might have them... Uh uh, well, it's, it's serious. It uh, sounds like it's going to be uh, quite the storm. But anyway, it'll be a slash weather report and uh, and legislative report from uh, from around the districts. We have a fun hour. A couple of legislators will be joining us uh, later in the hour. Uh, the, Mike Nathy, who is in the Republican leadership, as well as uh, Roscoe Striley. Striley. And uh, he uh, introduced an interesting bill today that is uh, uh, going right at some of the gun control debate that's going on nationally to say, not so close, feds. Don't uh, d- don't uh, don't you impose uh, your views on us. We'll talk with him about that. We'll talk with Mike Nathy a little bit about uh, uh, some of the uh, bills he's watching closely. And in this first hour, uh, Dale will introduce our guests in just a moment. But we're looking forward to a focus on two newcomers on the Public Service Commission, Julie Fedorchuk as well as Randy Christman. Should be fun. Quick uh, run through Dale on what happened today in the legislature. Dale Wetzel, the managing editor for uh, the Great Plains Examiner and uh, uh, the uh, Great Plains News Service. Uh, what, what, uh, what do you think was the headline today? Well, I thought it was the tribal speech. It, uh, a gentleman, the chairman of the three affiliate excuse me i say that the chairman of the turtle mountain band of chippewa his name is richard mcleod he's a postal worker and a businessman on the reservation he gave the tribal speech today i use tribal speeches shorthand what the purpose of it is is to allow uh, a representative of north dakota's indian tribes essentially to speak directly to the legislature to a joint session about the concerns of the of Indian country, what's being, what's going on there, what sort of concerns they have, what they would like to see the legislature do uh, to aid them. And uh, what Mr. McLeod talked about was he said he would like to see some of the state's uh, oil revenue, uh, its surplus, invested in uh, job training and other uh, assistance programs for, uh, for reservations. He also talked about expanding the Turtle Mountain Reservation itself and said it would provide a better opportunity for home ownership or property ownership for members of the tribe. And it was a, quite a nice it was quite a nice speech. He brought a number of young people from the reservation and they were there and it, it kind of lent a, a festive air. And and frankly the speech is generally a, a festive thing because there's the traditional Indian ceremonial aspect to it, drums and singing and and there's quite a nice uh, lunch that's laid out before, uh, before the speech itself. Well, and there's well, a, just why, a, why would you mention the food? I didn't. I looked at the food. I didn't eat it. But uh, it's. I mean, it's. It's quite. It's a. It's a spread that the legislators look forward to. I understand, and uh, but yeah. Max Schneider was raving about it earlier. Yes. He just said, it, it was, I mean, "Is it? Is it? Is the? Is that the big draw? Is that how they? Uh, they put on a good." Uh, a good chow? Well, he, well, told, he told me it was fry bread, is what Max said. It was very good well, fry bread. Well, there's a number of interest groups that put put on lunches, breakfasts occasionally, food at the Great Hall. And I, this, I, is, I, this is one of the best um, spreads. Let's I, just put it that way. I've been here four days this week. I don't know how there's a legislator that's less than 300 pounds anywhere in the legislature. That- well, some of them... Get close <laughs> by the end of the session. <laughs> anyway, good recap. And, uh, of course, uh, GreatPlainsNews.com as well as Great Plains Examiner. Uh, pick up a copy and uh, follow what's happening in the legislature. Uh, you can also listen to uh, uh, Dale on our stations. And, of course, he's uh, doing updates on 550K Fire, 7 o'clock in the morning, 12 noon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and also at 445 every afternoon. We're doing a, a recap and a preview of this program in the legislature today. Let's introduce our first guest from the Public Service Commission, Dale. It's Julie Fedorchik. When I met Julie, this was, uh, boy, it was 92, I believe, or maybe maybe a little later than that. Um, <clears throat> Julie Fedorchik is, uh, was born Julie Liffrig. Her father was a highway commissioner, the highway commissioner, in the administration of Republican Governor Al Olson in the early 80s. When I met Julie, I, uh, when I worked for the Associated Press, uh, Julie came on board as the press secretary for Governor Ed Schaefer in the mid-90s. 
and she also she worked for Ed Schaefer. She worked for Governor John Hoven, and she worked uh, for Senator John Hoven when he was elected to the Senate. In fact, her last job before she became a public service commissioner was as the state director for Senator Hoven, based in Bismarck. And uh, she's uh, an up and comer, I guess I would describe it. Uh, and she's she's got a a, a long background in public policy and politics, and it'll be very interesting to see uh, how well she adapts to her new job. So how well are you adapting to your new job, uh, Julie? <laughs> well, uh, it's been a whole six days, I believe, since uh, I started, and it's been a very interesting week. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's um, probably more uh, fun than I expected. The staff is phenomenal. Uh, the other commissioners are great to work with. And, um, you know, I came in expecting that my policy experience and my years in state government and, and even a couple years with the federal government would have been my greatest asset coming in. And I'm kind of finding that my position as a consumer and a, a North Dakota citizen and a, a mom and a, you know, uh, a, a family member in North Dakota is probably as valuable as as the, my years of poly experience. I ha- I'm glad I have that experience in state government, but I think it's, um, I'm seeing myself um, viewing the issues through the eyes of a citizen, and I, I think that that's a great, uh, a valuable resource. Could you try to quantify that when you mean, what you mean when you say I'm viewing it through the eyes of a citizen? Well, <clears throat> one of the things that the public, probably the Public Service Commission's greatest role, and this is why I think I'm really going to enjoy serving on this uh, in this agency is they protect or are looking out for the consumer in a variety of areas um, that we regulate. One of them is electric and um, gas uh, utilities. Um, another one is in um, pipeline sightings and uh, another is in you know grain warehousing and storage. And another big one is in licensing and in, in uh, weights and measures. And so we're out there trying to make sure that the, these various businesses are operating fairly. That there's a you know a fair competitive environment for them to to operate in, and that they are um, treating consumers fairly. You can't go shop around for a different electrical company to buy your electrical service. So you have to trust that the one that is providing your electrical service is doing so in a fair way. They aren't gouging you in terms of price, and uh, that they're you know taking care of the environment and doing all these important things. And, and that they have a reliable service. So that's the role of the Public Service Commission. So in other words, when you buy a gallon of gasoline, the Public Service Commission makes sure that it is indeed a gallon. Exactly. The, and the weights and measures area is one of the, the most interesting, I think. And it's one that I mention to people when they ask, what, what do you do? And so I try to find a practical example. And, and the weights and measures is one of those things that was started, you know, at the early stages of our country. I think that Thomas Jefferson or one of our early leaders decided we need to make sure that there is that people can count on what that they're buying a you know pound of apples that it's a pound of apples otherwise not only does the consumer get ripped off but the other competitors get ripped off too and so you have to have that fair um, playing field to support a uh, a good environment for business and and that's the public service commission's role early on you said that this was more fun than you anticipated uh, can you Tell me what you meant by that. Well, when you tell people that you're going to serve on the Public Service Commission or that this is a job that you want, they look at you kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Even one of the people And maybe you enjoy trips to the dentist, too. <laughs> yes, uh, that- exactly. So you want to learn about electric regulatory policy. And so, you know, it seems like it's going to be rather dry and technical. But when you're looking at it from the eyes of how does this affect people, how does this affect people who are buying power or um, gas, or how does it affect, um, you know, landowners when they're having a, a pipeline for gas or oil sited through their area? How does how do these various um, issues affect people? It makes it very interesting and fun. What Can you tell us how you came to be on the Public Service Commission? How did this evolve? Sure. About a year ago, um, when, when uh, it was, when Tony... Clark decided that he was going to um, pursue the FERC uh, uh, role. 
on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and it became apparent that he, he wasn't going to run again, and his position became open. I was somewhat interested in that, and then Randy decided that he w was going to go and go for that, and I thought, well, he's got really good credentials for that spot, so I wasn't going to take on Randy. And so he, That's a good uh, thing for Randy, I'm sure. <laughs> well, a good thing for me, too, I think. And so he went for it, and... Uh, and pursued that and then I sort of then I was appointed to be the state director for Senator Hoban which was another good opportunity for me so that was great and then w when Kevin uh, looked like he was in a strong position to win then I started talking to folks and saying I might be interested and then one thing led to another and I got the appointment. What do you think about being an elected official? I mean you're, you haven't been elected yet but I presume that at some point you will want to be on the ballot. What do you, what do you think about that? It's a mind switch for me. I mean, I have to change my mindset because I've always served, you know, elected officials, and it's different being one yourself. Um, it's easy to tell people what you think they should do or what positions they should take, and when you're um, thinking about yourself being the ultimate decision maker, it's different. But, you know, I, I, I think I've been well prepared for that and I think the whole process of how you think through issues is the same and it's just that I have the final say and I don't just have to try to advocate or convince somebody else to agree with what I think they should do so I enjoy it. Well your father as a former highway commissioner your brother uh, ran for the U.S. Senate one year against Byron Dorgan could you just tell us about your family background? Sure well we are uh, a large family I've got uh, there's eight of us seven seven older siblings and all but one of us still live in North Dakota so we're kind of diehards we were have lived all over the state. I have family members just about any community I can go to, so I don't necessarily need to build a state for housing. <laughs> I can stay with a family member, <laughs> so I'm going to be cheap. It's, 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 it's good when you're running for election, too, I, I imagine. a cheap investment. And uh, we have always been politically active. My parents just really instilled in us the importance of being involved, caring that it matters, that public policy does matter, and that um, you need to be involved in, in your communities and helping to make your your state and your uh, communities better places to live. So, Tell us about the first campaign you worked on. Oh my goodness, I have to think back. First campaign was probably um, Ed Schaefer's second campaign for re-election and uh, and I was serving in the governor's office so it was one of those where I had to kind of work all day and then in the evenings go help pitch out pitch in and and uh, you know it's just a great learning experience it's uh, you cover the whole state you get to meet a lot of people walk in lots of parades it's it's very demanding and challenging but it's a lot of fun too you've worked for Ed Schaefer and you've worked for John Hoven how would you just how would you compare those two fellows well they're very different um, but they have one thing in common, and they really uh, have a, a servant's heart in, in terms of wanting to do the right thing and wanting to, wanting to grow North Dakota and, and do the right thing for the people. Um, their personalities are very different. They both have a real uh, strong business background, and so I think they kind of come at things um, as businessmen. But, uh, but they're you know, just different personalities. We're, we've been talking to our, one of our newest public service commissioners. Her name is Julie Fedorchik, and uh, she was appointed by Governor Jack Dalrymple, and uh, she is up for election in two years. And uh, thank you for coming, Julie. Thank you. I appreciate it. And good luck with your new venture. Thank I'm you. Very excited about it. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, by the way, we want to thank our sponsors, too, Touchtone Energy Cooperatives of uh, North Dakota, the North Dakota Rural Association of Rural Electric Cooperatives, uh, and, uh, and their members, including Minkota Power. Uh, we thank them uh, very much for being a sponsor of uh, tonight's broadcast, and will be joining us uh, weekly as a uh, sponsor. And the uh, North Dakota Association of the Rural Electric Cooperatives will be sponsoring a, a dinner for legislators uh, next, uh, next Monday, and uh, we'll be talking more about uh, their issues of accountability and integrity and innovation and uh, commitment to community in the uh, coming weeks of the legislature today radio show as well so thanks to the north dakota association of rural electric cooperatives your touchstone energy cooperative and also minquota power for being a sponsor of ours on the legislature today radio show live from the peacock Antley american girl and bar in downtown bismarck now w which one of these two is the longest serving a public service commission member uh, uh, uh randy is it randy what do you got uh, how does and that? that was as i understand it that was deliberate he has a day on me <laughs> the senior, did you get a better office out of that deal, Julie? Or <laughs> he <what>? sure did. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you, Dale, introduce our, our next guest, another member of the Public Service Commission joining us. Thanks, Julie. Mr. Randy Christman, uh, former senator Randy Christman. He is from Hazen. He's a rancher. He was 
part of a historic election, actually. Uh, was it 1994, Randy? Uh, when Randy Chrisman and Randy Schobinger were two of the Republican senators that gave the Republicans in the Senate the majority. And Randy represented District 33 in the, in the Senate. It's, a, it's coal country, coal country, ranching country. Randy eventually became the assistant majority leader in the North Dakota Senate. And last year, he decided to run for the Public Service Commission. He had some, thought he had some background there because of his representation of uh, North Dakota's coal country with its coal mines, its power plants, its power lines. All of these things are things that the Public Service Commission, Service Commission deals with as a regulatory agency. And we have him here this evening. So welcome, Randy. Well, thanks, uh, Dale, and thanks, Scott, for, for having me on in the, the first week of the new venture. It's, an, I think, an exciting one. I'm proud to be a part of it. What is your imp- What are your impressions now of being a public service commissioner? Well, you know, it, all day long I, I am up there kind of feeling a little bit homesick for the Senate. Uh, for 18 years, I have really enjoyed the legislative process. But I, as, I, as I said a few times during the course of the last year, I do think that the good things that we have going in North Dakota are most threatened by the regulatory world, not the policy-making world right now. So I'm glad to have moved over and, and become a part of the regulatory world and, and try and make sure that here within North Dakota, our Public Service Commission job does a good job of regulating and, and doesn't stifle growth and development, but just does it the way it ought to be done. What have you learned so far? Well, I've learned that I have a lot to learn, uh, for, for one thing. I've learned that we have a tremendous staff and, and that has been so wonderful because, you know, I don't care what kind of new job you come into. There's a lot of details to learn. You uh, have plans for doing certain things different than what it's been done in the past. But you come in and you find out that maybe there were some reasons that you didn't know why it's been done the way it was done before. And, and so the staff has been delightful in, in both um, encouraging new ideas but explaining the rationale for the old ways. I'm very pleased to work uh, with Julie, who you had on earlier. Uh, she is going to be a tremendous commissioner. And, and then the, the other thing, and it's not a learning thing. I'm not surprised at all. But uh, our fellow commissioner, Brian Kalk, uh, has been there for four years now. And he is really providing good leadership to, to help us get started and make sure that we're able to do the best job that we can. How do you explain your job to people who ask you about it? What do you say to them? I explain it as, as being a complete balancing act, uh, almost regardless of, of what subject we're on, whether it's elevators, whether it's gas and electric, whether it's weights and measures, pipeline siding, whatever it might be, it's a balancing act. Because the, the end goal is what's best for consumers, but just the cheapest price isn't necessarily what's best for consumers. Uh, we need to make sure that utilities get adequate returns, that their investors get adequate returns, so that they want to continue to invest and get the infrastructure in that we need that benefit all of us. Yet at the same time, these are monopoly situations for the most part, so we need to make sure that they're not making those investments and then taking advantage of people. Those consumers, we want to get them all the best possible services but also at the best possible prices. Your experience as a state senator, how has that helped you adjust to this new job? Well, you know, I think I bring a perspective of knowing that as a regulator, it's not my job to just do whatever I want. Uh, I'm a big believer in the the legislative process and and that they are the policy-making branch of government. And and sure, we uh, issue rules and things like that on on issues that are unclear. We have cases where there's tough decisions that could go either way, and we have to make a decision one way or the other. But when there's a subject where the legislature has weighed in and passed a law, and the governor signed it, and it's the law of of the land, as far as I'm concerned, our job is to follow that law, not to try and find some angle to get around it. What if... uh There was a situation where the legislature decided that it was a good idea to have some sort of major encroachment on the jurisdiction of the Public Service Commission. Would you uh, feel for that as a legislator or a former legislator or as a Public Service Commissioner? Well, 
if if they encroached in a way that I thought was going to be harmful to the consumers, I would sure be down there lobbying my old friends and trying to make sure that they don't do that. I was going to ask you, do they, since you're turned to the dark side here, are they still treating you with respect? Th- there's a few that will still talk to me. About okay. <laughs> for, for the most part, they're kind of forgetting me quickly. I have to call them to ask for help on getting a few things passed that, that I still carry an interest in from my days in th- District 33. Tell, tell us a bit about your personal background, Randy. Where are you from? I'm from up at Hazen. Uh, where you thought earlier, Monsignor um, yeah, so I'm, from, from Mary, I, I from just, Hazelton. I just, you know, I, just, I just heard him wrong through my headset. <laughs> I thought Hazen, Hazelton. Mm, he did get a little defensive about that, didn't he? I don't, he I, certainly I, did. I don't think and he was, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't blame it, it him. Must be a, it must be a, a common uh, you know, a little confusion. Well, I'm sure that people in Hazen and Hazelton were both equally insulted. <laughs> 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 well, I, I'm sure they're awful proud to have him oh, from yes, their hometown ab- over in Hazelton. Absolutely. But uh, that's where I'm from. I uh, grew up on a, on a ranch up there, have made my living and ranching most of my life besides having some other side jobs along the way um we we still have that ranch uh, uh, my wife bethany uh used to work in the capital before i met her and, and got her to come up to hazen and marry me she works at the bank up there as a mortgage loan officer and uh over the years, I, I did the 18 years in the Senate that, that you mentioned earlier. I also served for 13 and a half years as a director of a telecommunications cooperative and a very successful one. Really proud of that track record. And that is another you know subject matter that we haven't had a lot of problems with in North Dakota, but it is a part of the Public Service Commission's uh, area of interest uh, to make sure that, that we have those telecommunications services that people want. Now, the Public Service Commission doesn't regulate cooperatives. Uh First of all, do you think that they should? And secondly, how has your experience as a rural telephone director informed what you're doing now? Well, we, we don't regulate the, the cooperatives directly. However, there is some minimal oversight in that the, the Public Service Commission uh, has to grant them approval as a carrier in order for them to, to meet their federal guidelines. Uh, but there's also the, the competition that the telephone cooperatives face uh, from cable providers, from cellular. Our company happens to be a cellular provider. But those are regulated entities that are in kind of competition, and, and we want to make sure that they work well together. Right. And bring Mr. Right Mr. Randy Crisman, who is uh, one of the new public service commissioners in North Dakota, uh, thank you for coming, Randy. Absolutely. Anytime. Hope to be back again sometime. Uh, I'd like that. Both Julie and Randy were saved in that a question just came at the last minute asking about cell phone coverage drops on I-94. They're going to have to Uh-oh. save that for the next visit for these Uh-oh. two. Uh, plenty of time to prepare for that I'm question. Sure I'm sure you're both personally responsible. Get those questions in a little bit sooner, folks. GreatPlainsNews.com. Two members of the legislature uh, joining us next to recap the week that was and look at some interesting legislation. The Legislature Today radio show continues on 550 K Fire, AM 1100 The Flag, and AM 1090 Talk Radio, The Flag in the Bakken. We are back on the uh, comment, the uh, wrong radio show. <laughs> it's the Legislature Today radio show. We're live at the Peacock Kelly about 26 minutes before the uh, top of the hour. Going to chat with a couple of legislatures about a couple of key issues, including. Uh, an issue that ties to a debate we're all hearing about on the national level on, uh, on gun control in just a moment, and then also a little bit of legislative perspective from uh, uh, Mike Nathie's going to join us to talk a little bit about uh, his reaction and uh, the buzz he's hearing on the uh, on the K-12 through education proposal that uh, has been dominating a lot of the coverage. Only natural he should do that because he's chairman of the House Education Committee. Exactly right. I am Scott Hennon. Dale Wetzel is the managing editor of Great Plains News and uh, uh, going to be uh, conducting the questioning. We want to thank our sponsor for this half hour, Concerned Women for America in the North Dakota chapter. Uh, Yana Murdahl and her group out there with uh, a lot of issues that they'll obviously be addressing before the uh, legislative session, and we look forward to uh, visiting with them about uh, their issues over the, uh, over the coming legislation. We welcome them as a sponsor as well of uh, the uh, broadcast of the legislature today. They'll take it away with Roscoe. Mr. Roscoe Striley, who is, uh, I believe, serving his second uh, session in his second section, Excellent. and he just joined the House Appropriations Committee, which is a rarity, frankly, for someone in their second session. So congratulations for that. The House Appropriations Committee uh, is in charge of spending money. And I, Mr. Striley, I just wanted to ask you, what's your approach to spending the public's money? Well, I'm, like we've talked in the past, and thanks for having me on, but uh, I'm very conservative, so I'm going to obviously watch the budgets and uh, look into them in great detail. It's it's a lot of spending, a lot of it we need uh, in the infrastructure out west and the flood projects, water projects. Um, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more tax relief in that, but I'm 
conservative in nature, and that's how I'm going to approach the Appropriations could, Committee. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Where are you from, and what's your job? I am in uh, live in Minot, District 3, which is uh, downtown uh, Minot, southeast Minot, out to Surrey, and some rural uh, rural areas. Uh, originally from Leeds, North Dakota, small town. Um, you know, right now I've uh, lived there about 10, 11 years in Minot and uh, work at a bank, do IT, and uh, got a couple restaurants and a few other business uh, business ventures. Uh, wife and two kids and one on the way, so. Well, congratulations. Thank two you. restaurants. What kind of restaurants are they? Uh, fast food, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you have a uh, proposal in, I haven't seen it yet, uh, that deals with uh, gun control. Could you describe it for us, please? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's not a nullification bill. I know that's been floated around by uh, some of the more liberal members. But uh, what it basically says is if any gun control reg- uh, regulations come down, either through executive order, resolution, bill, whatever it would be, after uh, the 31st of last year, so it's got emergency cause uh, and retroactive, would not allow local law enforcement officials to enforce them. Uh, we're not saying that the federal government doesn't have jurisdiction. We know they do. They've got uh, the right to put whatever they want on us. It's just saying that no state resources, uh, if it was confiscation, which I hope that you know, does, we don't get to that point, no state resources can be used for that, period. Well, I presume federal resources could be, though. Yep. The federal, you know, ATF, we can't tell ATF or the feds what they can and can't do, um, unfortunately, in this case. But what we could do is uh, the, we, the locals aren't allowed to uh, prosecute, investigate, do any type of uh, help in any way, grant money, uh, accept grant money, that kind of stuff. And there is uh, penalties in it for, say, if a sheriff didn't do it, there's a five-year penalty and uh, removal from office, a misdemeanor, if they would do this. If they would enforce a federal gun control measure? If, yeah, if, if this law goes into effect. Okay. It doesn't include any of the previous laws on the books. Obviously those, you know, we would enforce them and I don't have a problem with the ones on the books. It's any new ones uh, that are unreasonable, which I'm sure we're going to get. Uh, the North Dakota citizens, I think, by and large are strong Second Amendment uh, advocates and I am uh, definitely a strong advocate. Uh, just to put it crudely, aren't you asking people to violate their oath of office? I mean, don't people take an oath to defend the Constitution and and the laws? And wouldn't if you're telling state officials and local officials not to enforce laws, aren't you telling them to violate their oath of office? Well, if some of the more radical proposals that we're hearing out of the vice president of the president's office come down, they're violating the Constitution, in my opinion, right there. So this is strengthening the Constitution, I think. It's reinforcing our, our right to bear arms, which I think is very clear in the Second Amendment. So I would look at it as we're protecting that right, not vi- they wouldn't be violating that right. What if it's a, uh, the, whatever federal rule comes down is something that would not uh, bring about a great deal of public objection? And I'm thinking about something such as uh, increased background checks or maybe you cannot... Uh, obtain a gun if you have some sort of mental health diagnosis. Yeah, and it's a, that's a good question, and that's not what it's geared at. I, I totally support uh, the mental health uh, checks, and in fact, I think that's where our issue lies. Our issue doesn't lie in what type of gun you have, how many uh, bullets you can put in a magazine. It's strictly mental health, in my opinion. And, and increased background checks, I don't, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, th- those are the two areas that I would find common ground is uh, background checks and uh, mental health is the issue we need to focus on. What do you think is the state of gun regulation in North Dakota, strictly from a state perspective? I mean, do you think that uh, that state gun laws are too strict? Do you think they're too lax? What What is your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, I think we've got a pretty good mix here. I would be for opening up the uh, concealed carry even more. Um, but, you know, we've got fairly fairly light regulations, and I think are appropriate in our state for the amount of uh, hunting that goes on and just the strong uh, desire for uh, uh, Second Amendment that everybody supports more strongly than, say, New York in our state. So I think we've got a good balance, and, in fact, I would support uh, opening them up even, loosening them even further. I would, I would be interested to know how you'd accomplish that because, you know, just for full disclosure, I have a concealed carry permit. And I thought it was pretty easy to get. 
Yep, and it, as do I. But I would actually even support uh, an automatic issue, provided that you uh, mental health issues and background checks, kind of similar to Wyoming. Granted, that opens it up for reciprocity and t- stuff like that. But I, you're right; it isn't that difficult. It's you know four hour class and a, a fairly reasonable fee. I, I also have a concealed carry and a lifetime member of the NRA and uh, support gun rights. Obviously. Do you think that? Uh do you think that there should be any re- any permit required to carry a concealed weapon in North Dakota? I mean, I like I, like I just previously stated, I would support that bill. In fact, uh, if to not have a permit at all, it, it, where it's an automatic issue with your driver's license, let's say, um, provided that you you know there's background reasonable background and mental health checks, which I don't think is that tough. Okay, uh, so to do. Do, I, I'm just trying to figure out what would you think would be appropriate as a as a minimum standard. Well, provided you pass the background check, I mean they're pretty they're pretty straightforward. So you should have a criminal background check. Yes, I, and, I would and, support that. And you yeah. should have uh, some assurance that you are not mentally ill. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And the rest of it is kind of superfluous. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, do you think that the type of bill that you're proposing is legal in a in a federal sense? You can't that. You, essentially, as I understand it, you're instructing state and local officials not to enforce federal law. Is that going to get these federal and local, or these state and local officials into trouble with the federal government? You know, there's similar states I just saw today that have passed uh, somewhat similar legislation right now. Um, it, it's it's not ignoring federal law. It's just saying they cannot prosecute, confiscate, put anybody in jail if the ATF wants to do it. We're not going to be able to stop him, and it doesn't say that the sheriff, you know, has to arrest the ATF agent. It's nothing like that. All it's saying is state resources, local resources cannot be used in that fashion. If ATF want, agents want to come in, we can't stop them. So, I mean, it, it's not, it doesn't go that far. What has been the feedback that you've gotten from this proposal? Uh, so far, very positive. Uh, you know, we've had a few email questions and whatnot. For the most part, it's been very positive, and... Uh, I think is has a reasonable chance of passing. What sort of questions are you getting? Uh, basically, just you know, it's a four-page bill, and basically, just what what it all entails. It's it's fairly detailed, as opposed to the the uh, Wyoming one, which is pretty straightforward. A few paragraphs. This one's a little more detailed. So, just basically, the nitty-gritty details of the bill. So. Are there other areas of public policy where the same logic would apply? Where you'd like to say, state officials can enforce. Uh, I don't know, the federal health care law. I would absolutely support that. Okay. I, I, I don't know that that's... Are you going to uh, put the bill in? It, it, yeah, maybe. But, I mean, I think it's a bad... Uh, the Obamacare is a terrible law, and I think the citizens of North Dakota believe that, and I, it's only going to drive costs up, and I would strongly support uh, opting out of the whole thing. Is this sort of logic, does it, frankly, end in the dissolution of the union? No, <laughs> no, I don't think we, I don't think we go down that road, but... Uh, what it is is strengthening state rights. The states are losing their rights more and more every year, every day, and I think we need to uh, strengthen and let the federal government know that we do have rights as states, and they are very powerful, and we need to flex our muscles and push back over the overreaching uh, burden of the federal government. If there was litigation involved here as a result of the law that you're proposing, would you, do you think that the, that's something the taxpayers would want to pay to defend? Absolutely. I mean, we've we've got a million dollars sitting in a an account waiting to uh, sue if fracking were to be banned, and I don't see any uh, other. I would support legislation to appropriate money to defend this type of law too. We are ha- we've been talking to Minot State Representative Roscoe Striley of Minot. He's a Republican and works in information technology at a Minot bank and is a businessman. He's a he's serving in his second. Uh, session of the North Dakota Legislature, and he is on the Appropriations Committee, which is a kind of a plum assignment for a second session legislator. Did you know he's, Thank, a, did you, did you know he's a Boston University grad? I did not I, know I went, that. I went, uh, so he I, went I did to school wa- in Massachusetts. No, oh no, 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 no. I graduated from Wapaton. Okay. I went one year to Grand Forks and went to an, uh, 
uh, accelerated corporate education at Boston University. So oh, okay. I'm not a grad. It wasn't. It wasn't a tour for your college. I'm, so, I'm was, surprised you set foot in Massachusetts. No, no, no. I was, was going to ask him well, who he rooted for when there's BU UND hockey matchups. You well, know, you know, yeah, UND all the way, and the Celtics, by the way. There you oh, go. Okay. Well, that, that'll yeah, do. Yeah. Thanks, Roscoe. Good to see you. Thank yep. you for your time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you joining Thanks for us. Coming. Yes. Uh, we have another member of the uh, Republican leadership joining us uh, on the uh, program tonight. Mike Nathy is uh, is next up, and uh, Mike uh, is uh, is a uh, member of the uh, was well, chairing the Education Committee and is uh, as well the uh, chairman of the Republican uh, House Caucus and uh, represents uh, Bismarck's District Thirty. How are you, Mike? Good to see you. Thank you, Scott. G- good to see you, Dale. Uh, go ahead and take away on the questioning for uh, Representative Nathy. Mr. Nathy, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Uh, what what is where are you from? What do you do? I am uh, originally from Minnesota. I was born in Montevideo, Minnesota, in the southwestern part of the state. I understand that endears you to Scott Henry. Yes, it does. Scott and I grew up in the same town. Scott uh, graduated a year after I did. Graduated with my brother, Mark. And So uh, you knew this guy in high I school? I knew Scott from when we were both about three feet high. Oh, he's, my goodness. He's old, though. He's an 82 grad. I'm an 83. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the Mohawks. <laughs> the Go so Mohawks. That Scott's father had owned the radio station out there. But uh, graduated from there. I went to the University of Minnesota. Uh, to play baseball. I was recruited to play baseball there. And uh, uh, What position did you play? I was a pitcher. I was a pitcher. And, uh, what, was your, what were your strengths? Control. I was a left-handed pitcher, so being left-handed in baseball gives you a little bit of an edge. And just before my junior year... I'm surprised year, you're still not playing. Well, just before my junior year, I was in a pretty nasty car accident and lost part of my left collarbone, so my baseball career came to a screeching halt. But my roommate played eight years in the majors. Uh, Who so was he? Brian Hickerson from uh, Bemidji, Minnesota. I'll be darned. So, uh, yeah, so I had a lot of fun and... Uh, Enjoyed that great experience. We used to practice with the Twins in the, in the uh, wintertime and uh, used to play basketball with Kirby Puckett before anybody knew who Kirby Puckett was. So, uh, How was, was he? Terrible basketball player. Really? Yeah, he was terrible. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the minute he hit big time, we didn't see much of him after that. But, uh, so, but anyways, I, 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 um, I'm a funeral director by trade. I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a mortuary science degree. Worked uh, 10 years down there. Uh, my wife I met in Minneapolis. She's from Bismarck originally. And once I married into the family, my uh, in-laws are big hunters. And so they dragged me out to the Badlands for many years to go deer hunting. And uh, I fell in love with western North Dakota. Had and you been uh, hunting before then? I'd never deer hunted. I had hunted uh, uh, upland game in Minnesota, but never deer hunting. And uh, so I really loved it. And I uh, had itched after my uh, oldest uh, child was born to get out of Minneapolis. I lived there, gone to school there, lived there. And... Um, uh, wanted to open up a funeral home up here. So I did my, came up here about a half dozen times on my own and, and talked to business people and bankers and this and that. And uh, two gentlemen I worked for in Minneapolis decided to help me out and got going. So when I moved here in 95, I knew two people, my two brother-in-laws. That was the only, only uh, people I knew and just kind of started from there. So hey, was, that, was that difficult, frankly, because of the funeral business is a relationship yeah, business? It, yeah, it was, it was. They were, at that time, corporately owned, and, and uh, I had competed against them down in Minneapolis. So, yes, it was very difficult because, uh, again, in the funeral business, it's relations and you deal with generations, and here comes a new guy from Minneapolis knowing just a couple people and really starting from ground zero. So uh, we bought the land, started the funeral home, and away we went. We wanted to speak to you about uh, Governor Dalrymple's education proposal. Yes. You're, you're the chairman of the House Education Committee, and you had uh, kind of a pre-hearing, I guess I'd call it, uh, the other day about this bill. You had uh, a gentleman from the Department of Public Instruction, Jerry Coleman, walk through it with you. Uh, can you tell us your initial impressions? Well, I'm, uh, I'm very familiar with the bill. Um, I'm actually going to be signing on with the bill and, and uh, spent a couple hours with the governor uh, yesterday going through the bill page by page myself and, and a handful of other people. So uh, my initial impression is, is, is I like it. I mean, I know that the price tag scares a lot of people. Um, some of my colleagues, but I like what they're trying to do. I like the results as far as giving it uh, property tax reform, as far as helping with the cost of property tax by the state picking up a bigger share of the K-12 education. And can you tell us, what is the difference between the approach we have now, where essentially we're providing a a subsidy for to uh, compensate school districts for so many property tax mills, and the approach that the governor wants well, to... Well, right, you know, right now, now everything's kind of based on the valuations of one's property and with the mills, with the mill levy reduction buy-down that we have. This approach will sever that. So this approach, we're putting all the money into just the K-12 education per student pupil. Right now, the state pays roughly a little over $3,900 per student. Under uh, Governor uh, Dahlrup's proposal, the first year would be eighty-eight ten. The second year would be a little over $9,000. Now, that is all based on a study that was done for the state that uh, defined what the core curriculum was. And back in uh, 2008 is when it was done. 
And uh, so I listed the different programs, instructionals, all those kind of things. Um, back at that time, I think it was a little over seven thousand dollars. What is what it would have cost? They inflated it three percent each year for inflation. So that's how we get we start with eighty eight ten. So. And when, I presume, as chairman of the Education Committee, you get a lot of questions from your colleagues about what does this mean? Uh, what kind of questions do you get, and how do you respond to them? Well, the, the big question we get is, you know, is this, is this really property tax? Is this going to give some relief to our constituents? And, and, and is this sustainable down the road? I think those are the two big questions. You know, there's a lot of people out there commenting on the bill who haven't seen it yet because, quite frankly, it has not been filed. Yes. You know, we were just putting the finishing touches on it uh, yesterday and uh, will most likely be filed, if not tomorrow, uh, early next week, Monday. So it's a big bill. It's going to take a lot of work. But really, to answer your question, Dale, it's, uh, you know, uh, will this provide the relief that we want to give to the North Dakotans, and is it sustainable down the road? I mean, when when Governor, when you and Governor Downerville were going through the bill, uh, for want of a better term, were you confident that he had a the right vision in mind in terms of the future of education funding. Yeah, and, and, and you know we probably have the most pro uh, education governor in our in our history of North Dakota. I mean, Governor Dalrymple is a true expert when it comes to education. I mean, he's he's been on he's headed up committees and and done all the research on it. I'm thoroughly impressed. I, he floated this uh, in front of me and my vice chair back in December, and I walked out of there and told my vice chair, who's uh, Rep- uh, Representative Mike Schatz from Dickinson, I said, you know, I really, really like this concept. And the more I look into it, the more I learn about it, the more I really like it. So um, it, it will provide relief because we're going to pick up a bigger share of that education tab uh, on one's property tax. So on that line item, we're going to pay a bigger portion. I just want to add one uh, comment I mentioned earlier to Dale that some of the chatter I was hearing today was critical of it. Uh, are you hearing a criticism from colleagues? Uh, not so much critical. Yeah, I think critical might be a bit strong, but I, I think it's more or less uh, they, di- they just don't know, so they have questions about it. And, I've, and I, I know they did an overview in the Appropriations Committee uh, yesterday, and I talked to some of the members, and they, were, they weren't negative, but they weren't, they weren't really sold on it. And I told them, is, hey, give the bill a chance to come out. Let's go through it step by step. So let's not judge or make any judgments on it right now. So, Aren't they kind of staggered by the, the amount of money? Yeah, I think the money scared everybody. It's, uh, you know, if it goes through, it will truly be the largest tax cut in, in, uh, in the history of the state. So, yeah. The, uh, as far as one, one, I don't know if you call it a criticism at this point, but one concern that I've heard, and you've heard it in your own committee, is how is this going to treat the rural school districts, school districts generally that maybe are small and shrinking instead of growing? Well, it, without divulging too much till we get till it comes out there, there, there are things in there that will address those problems um, as far as a fairness issue and, and things like that. So all I can say is just kind of wait, wait till it comes out. Okay, because, so. because Jerry Coleman, the, the Department of Public Instruction uh, person that I mentioned earlier, he essentially answered a question of one of the committee members uh, in, in Ms. Representative Nathie's committee, he said, if you are a big school district and you're growing, you're going to do all right. If you're a small school district and you're not growing, you're going to do less well because it is essentially a student-driven formula. The more students you have, the more money you get. Yeah, and under the bill, nobody goes backwards. I mean, nobody gets hurt. In the worst case scenario, they probably stay status quo. But everybody is going to see some sort of relief because the average relief uh, per school district is 50%. The, a- the average... And we're buying it down to 60 mills, and the average school district is 120 mills. So we buy it down to 60, so it's a 50% cut. Some schools are higher than that. Some schools are lower than that. So if your school's at 80 mills, and we cut it down to 60, and they have a 20 mil cut. So Is part of the disquiet at this point, if I could use that term, is, it, is there a worry about a loss of local control if you're, if you're <coughs> bringing the local share down No, I don't so think low. that's it. And, and, and Governor Dalrymple's proposal, there is local control, and, and you'll see it when, when, you, when you see the bill. I think the big question for us, especially in, in our Republican caucus, is which road do we want to go down? Do we want to go down this road? You know, is it our philosophy that we should, we all agree that we have to be there to support education, but do we want to go all, all in, or do we want to stick with the meal levy reduction buy-down that we have, or do a combination of, I think this will be one of two or three other components that will contribute to property tax relief. K-12, maybe a couple, two or three issues that will help bring down the property tax. I wanted to ask you something about, I was looking through the bills that have been filed so far, and I was looking at some of the ones you sponsored, and uh, there's one that I thought was kind of interesting. It, uh, it 
I mean, there's such a variety and diversity of bills that are introduced in the legislature. And this one has to do with uh, towing someone on water skis. Yes. And uh, it says an individual doesn't have to wear a life preserver if they are 16 years of age or older and engaged in windsurfing or board sailing. And uh, what was your reason for putting that <laughs> he in? He does well, come from the land of 10,000 lakes. He does. Right? That's so, right. Yeah. Well, if you look at it, Dale, it's, it, it, that's in Section 1. In a different yes. section, it, that is just lawyers putting it in one section for another so it fits. Okay. But the gist of the bill is is if I'm, if I'm towing Scott on the tube, I have to have somebody else sitting next to me in the boat to watch. Looking at him. Looking what at my him. constituent okay. wants is I have a mirror like we do in Minnesota and Florida so I can drive and just look in the mirror and not have to have somebody else in the boat. Okay. I asked the same question when I saw that. That's just... Legislative Council moving words around. Okay. So, so. The, so the point of the bill is you can drive with a mirror instead of having someone seated w- without next having, to you? Without having somebody watch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Very but simple. Essentially, you're watching yourself as the boat driver instead yeah, of Yeah, and, and there are studies that show that having a mirror is actually safer because, and I find myself doing this looking all, even though I have somebody watching, I still look over my left shoulder. You're better off to look in the mirror and just like driving a car. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, 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 by the way, didn't know that was illegal and, and have been doing it, doing I, it by, I, by a rear view I mirror. Found, I don't know if the but statute the, of limitations well, has expired I, I, on this I one. I found out pulling my son, and I had two mirrors on my uh, jet ski and uh, Game and & Fish. Uh, and there, you, had an, you have another bill. That I, I guess I would refer to it as a, uh, a oh, yeah. taxpayer yeah. notice bill when your property taxes are yeah. being considered. What, yeah. Could you describe that for yeah, us? Yeah, th- this one is really to hold uh, more to transparency to, to the local subdivisions, to the, co- to the counties and the school boards. And what this does is when you get your property tax statement in December, in this same uh, uh, envelope will be, a, for lack of a better word, an explanation letter. I'll say, Mr. Wessel, your t- property taxes went up as a result of the following issues. We'll list the issue and show the, the uh, votes of those commissioners or those school board members. Mm-hmm. So it will show all the issues that contribute to the increase of your property tax. Do you think that this information is not presented now? I think it's out there, but I don't think it's people have to go hunting for this. I think just... Just adds more transparency and gives people more information because in December when they get that property tax, that's when you have their attention. We do have one uh, question from a listener uh, wanting to know uh, from your district, by the way, that if you uh, they're, they're and can you please tell us where your district is? Uh, my district is uh, South Bismarck, that sort of a south part over by uh, over by the um, Missouri River towards uh, University of Mary, and then up towards Divide Avenue over by Sleepy Hollow up in that general area. They said the next time in your ballot, the answer to this question will determine whether or not. You get their vote. Okay. Are you ready for this? Do you really believe left-handed pitchers have an advantage in baseball? <laughs> yes, I do. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe you want to expand on that just a little bit just to try and you know, win but this guy need, over. But you need your whole collarbone. <laughs> yeah, you need your whole collar. Well, anybody yeah. can be right-handed. you got to be a little special to be left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank You're you for your time. Thank you for having me on. This is Representative Mike Nathy of Bismarck, a Republican the chairman of the House Education Committee and the chairman of the House Republican Caucus. Another legislature today is in the books. We're back Saturday, 10 a.m. to noon, live on 550 K Fire, AM 1100, the flag, and AM 1090 in the Bakken, folks. Thank you for listening to the Legislature Today radio show. And don't forget, we're back two hours every night, Monday through Thursday, all session long. You want to know what's happening on the legislature uh, scene? In North Dakota, you're listening right here to the Legislature Today. Have a great night, and thanks for listening.